Hello, brothers and sisters in the house of God. I'm Philip Shields, host of Light in the Rock. and Welcome to another session of Living uh, God's Word, Light in the Rock. I'm going to read and then talk about a verse so many of you know by heart even, and yet I don't know hardly anybody who really practices it. I believe it to be one of the hardest, most difficult of all scriptures to really practice and do. And this is the reason and purpose for this message today. Okay, let's read it in Philippians 4, verse 6 and 7. Philippians 4, verses 6 and 7. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving. Don't worry about anything, but in everything, while you give thanks, let your requests be made known to God. Do talk to God about it with thankfulness, without worry. We start from the beginning again. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and thanksgiving, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God, that the peace of God which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. I'm going to focus mostly, well, on three things really, but not being anxious and giving thanks for everything. Everything. Don't just read it, but do it. And if we do it, we're told the peace of God that you can't, it's so deep we can't even explain it will come upon us, will guard our hearts and minds. I'm going to break it down, like I said, to in everything. And, and, and also Ephesians 5.20 says, for everything give thanks. Everything? All things? Thank God even for the bad things? Everything includes bad things. Are we really supposed to thank God for bad things that happen to us? That's the challenge in today's sermon. Everything, all things, don't they mean everything and all things? Must include everything and all things, including what we consider to be bad things. I mean including the death of our loved ones. I mean including terrible pain that gets worse and accidents. It must include divorces. It must include terrible health news from our doctor. Does God really mean you to thank him for all that? Understanding this message today will change how you view God. Well, actually, you won't do this message until you first change how you view God. I want you to get that. You won't be able to do Philippians 4, 6, and 7 until we change the way we understand God and how he's working in us. If you do get this sermon, it, I promise you, it will change a lot in your life if you get it, if you see it, if you apply it. I believe it means what it says. No matter how bad something seems to us, when we really understand how and why, how and why we must thank God in and for everything, there develops a depth of relationship between you and God that was never there before. But I doubt that most of you would thank God or already are thanking God for your terrible pain or some horrible news about your family or yourself. But if we're not, then we don't believe that in everything and for everything means in everything and for everything. Some ministers have even told me to back off, that I'm going too far, that I surely can't take these, this verse literally. So, of course, they don't practice Philippians 4, verse 6 and 7 of thanking God literally with their mouths in everything and for everything, like Ephesians 5, 20 says. So listen carefully. And I hope you can come to understand how and why we must practice 
Philippians 4, verses 6 and 7, actually in, partly to be getting ready for the terrible times that are coming ahead of us. Remember, we are to live by every word of God. Matthew 4, 4 says that. Luke 4, 4 says it in the King James and New King James, but not in all the newer translations. They leave out. They leave out uh, the last part of what I just said, quoting Jesus, man shall not live by bread alone. It stops there in Luke 4, 4 and all the newer translations. And they leave out, but by every word of God, which was quoted from Deuteronomy 8, 3. So that's why I primarily use New King James. You, you guys may or may not realize this. There are scores of verses and words and scriptures that are left out of the NIV, the New Living, the Complete Jewish Bible, the ESV, the NASB, the Legacy, all of them. All of them leave out the last part of Luke 4.4. 4, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God is left out. At least in Luke 4.4. 4. They keep it in Matthew 4.4. 4. But we are to live by every word of God, according to Deuteronomy 8.3 at least. Why we need this topic, you'll reap so many blessings. You aren't even beginning to reap right now if you aren't practicing this. You will reduce stress. You will experience the peace of God instead. You'll be part of the joy of living by faith and trust in God, no matter what. I've talked about these scriptures before, but fine people don't seem to want to believe it. So, therefore, they can't practice it. Let's examine this most difficult verse to really practice it. I did give a whole sermon years ago probably eight or nine years ago. And I'll put the link in my notes here. Praising Jehovah, our Father, before we see his answers. Okay, make sure you hear that sermon to go along with this one as well. I'm focusing more on the why and the how in this sermon. Why are we being told to give thanks in all things? Okay, so let's break it down. Point number one, be anxious for nothing. Philippians 4, verse 6, the first part. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. But don't be worried about anything. Uh, don't be anxious about anything. Um, I heard that the American Psychological Society recently said that Americans are more anxious right now than at any other time in recorded history, in their recorded history. Anxiety worrying, being upset by events, deciding there's no way this series of events can work out for good. So you're thinking of all the bad things that are probably going to happen. It's just too bad right now. It's hard to even believe Romans 8.28, that as we put it, all things work together for good. And most of us stop the verse at that point. Too bad, because we missed the point. <clears throat> So when things are really terrible, hey, everything's going to work out for good. And in our mind, for good means the good that we see it to be good. Our definition of good. The only way we would never be anxious about anything is if we started to really understand that God is working with you, with me, in the details of our lives. He's aware of every little thing. He's aware when a sparrow falls down and dies. How much more is he aware of everything going on in your life? Jesus said. We won't be anxious when we really understand that he's using whatever he's allowing in our lives or sending to us, even sending to us. That God is refining, purifying, perfecting his saints. And the way he does that a lot of times is through pain and suffering. Not all the wonderful good things we think. God is refining you, preparing you for eternity. And the way he does that mostly is through pain and suffering. Somehow most of us want to believe that when we pray for help from God, he's going to respond by doing something beyond our wildest dreams. Sometimes he does. 
But sometimes the lion's mouths weren't stopped in the Colosseum. Sometimes his people did burn up at the stake and were not saved like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were. So suffering and pain are involved in our development of trust and faith, even if he's not answering the way we had in the natural hoped he would. Those who have not suffered, usually to me, seem to be very shallow people by comparison to those who have suffered a great deal. Even God's own Son, the captain of our salvation, Hebrews 2 verse 10 says, was perfected by the things which he suffered. I have various sermons on perfection that explain that in more detail. And so are we being perfected by the trials and sufferings. James 1 verses 2 to 4 it's very clear that we're to count it all joy when we have serious trials. For God is working through those very pains and sufferings and trials to perfect us. It goes on to say in verse 4. James 1, verses 2 to 4. 1 Peter 5, verses, verse 10. 1 Peter 5, verse 10. May the God of all grace, who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. After you have suffered a while, perfect you, strengthen you. First Peter 5, verse 10. In fact, Paul came to see that his thorn in the flesh, whatever that was, probably something to do with his eyes, was for God's strength to be seen in Paul's weakness. Second Corinthians 12, you guys may want to read verses 7 to 10 on your own. Sometimes I'll quote verses 9 and 10. 2 Corinthians 12, verses 7 to 10. So he praised God for his sufferings. 2 Corinthians 12, verse 9, And God said to me, Yeshua said to me, God said, My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness, in your weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, reproaches, needs, persecutions, distresses, for Christ's sake, for when I am weak, then I'm strong. It's when we're weak that we begin to receive the power of Christ himself resting upon us. It takes times when we are weak. If we could all see that when God called you to be one of his children, he is involved in your life implicitly. God has always used some level of trial, pain, and suffering to get us to look to Him and to stay looking to Him. Oh, it's easy when everything's going well. But it's in the pain and suffering that we're driven to our knees, much more so than when everything's going well. We have to realize we belong to Him. He bought us. He owns us. So even if we're not healed, even if we die, even if horrible things are happening, even if we're burned alive at the stake until we die and not delivered like Daniel's three friends, we must grow to the point where we're not going to be anxious about it. I'm not saying I'm there yet. I'm saying this is what it all means. We're his. There are times I've done it very well. There are times I haven't. He's working in us what he wants in us, more than our bodies, more than our physical things we own, more than our houses and physical things. He wants the things that cannot be seen. Okay, the, the character, the faith, the love. More than powerful answers. The trust, the character, the righteousness in spite of him apparently not answering, or so it seems, sometimes. But even Jesus, you know, he begged, is there any other way or do I really have to go through this as he prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, but not my will, but yours be done. And Hebrews says he, he was heard. He was heard all right. An angel came and strengthened him and said, yeah, you got to go through it. And we're all rooting for you. So he was heard and the answer was no, there's no other way. But we get the idea that a loving God would not let so many bad things happen to us. 
So if we conclude that, we're not understanding his word. We're not reading it correctly. Go back and reread all of Hebrews 11. And look at all the troubles that God's faithful had to go through. Now in Hebrews 11 verses 32 to 35, it talks about wonderful things that happened to those who had faith. That through faith subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, verse 33, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong. <clears throat> like Paul said, women received their dead raised to life again, verse 35. And then the end of verse 35, he changes his tune. Others were tortured. So here again, by faith, God got involved in their lives. And by faith, others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection, the first resurrection. Others had trial of mockings and scourgings, chains, imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two like Isaiah was. They were tempted. Imagine that, a powerful prophet of God. God allowed him to be sawn in two. Sometimes this is what God does. And we must learn not to be anxious about anything because we belong to him. And he's working something out. They were tempted. They were slain with the sword. Verse 37, Hebrews 11, 37. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, and tormented, of whom the world wasn't worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains and dens and caves of the earth, and all of these, having obtained a good testimony through faith, did not receive the promise. Not yet. We're also told in the verse in the chapter before this, Hebrews 10, in verse 34, that they even joyfully accepted the plundering of your goods. Hebrews 10, 34. Knowing that you have a better and enduring possession for yourselves, reserved for you in heaven. Wow, joyfully. Okay, someone crashes in your front door and tells you to get out with some choice words stuck in between. And they start to take everything you have. If we really understood that God's involved in every detail of our life and our goods is not what's important to God. It's not. It's our faith in him that is important. Joyfully accepted the plundering of your goods, knowing you have a better possession reserved. Sometimes people even misunderstand Romans 8.28. Many of you could quote it from memory, at least the first part. A few people take it all the way to the end when I hear them quoting it. Oh, all things work together for good, you know. Remember that. Everything works together for good. Yeah, that's the first half of the verse. To those who love God and to those who are the called, according to his purpose. Now let's read it again. When we say everything works together for good, what do we mean by that? We typically mean good means the way I define good. What I see is good. That's not what it says. Everything works out to good the way God defines good. That's what according to his purpose means. It will work out for what God has in mind, his purpose. Though we often don't see or understand what God is doing, remember we have to know God's going to work it out, even if it's long past our deadlines even if it involves suffering, pain, and even death. Be anxious for nothing. Another thing, too, is I remember going on a camping trip. We were all looking forward to it, the family was. And, and you know, when we got there, everything seemed fine, but we no sooner got our tents up, it started to drizzle, and then it turned into a heavy rain. And our wonderful camp out, suddenly was being rained on heavily. It's at that moment when one of our kids said, what an adventure. This isn't just an ordinary camp out, Dad. It's fun. 
So instead of worrying about it, look to the bad things as what an adventure this is turning into. It's going to be exciting to see how God works it out, or if God works out at all. You will see God more in your life, I guarantee you, and hear his voice more if you turn these things into adventures. Now, even a trivial example like the camping trip should help us understand what I'm saying here. Turn to Job 42, while I'm talking here, Job 42. When bad things happen, it doesn't mean God isn't working in your life. In fact, it's probably the exact opposite. Who sent Job's trials and sufferings? 90% of people I ever ask that question say, of course, Satan did. That's clearly Satan, Job chapter 1 and 2. But that's because they don't understand God and how he uses pain and suffering and uses whatever means he needs to to bring that about to perfect us, to refine us. Job had some pretty bad self-righteousness going on. He was a good man, self-righteously. God had to get that out of him. So in Job 42, verse 11, when it's all said and done, it says, Then all his brothers, sisters, and those who had been his acquaintances before came to him, ate food with him in his house. They consoled him and comforted him for all the adversity that the Lord had brought upon him. Did you even realize that verse was in the Bible? All the adversity the Lord had brought upon him. Do you remember Joseph? After his father Jacob died, Joseph's brothers were terribly scared in Genesis 50. You can turn there and read it with your own Bible. Uh, Genesis 50. Now what's Joseph going to do with, with dad gone? He, he's probably going to kill us or hurt us or sell us as slaves. Let us know what it felt like. Well, when Joseph's brothers were selling him into captivity, and when he was thrown into the dungeon after being faithful to God's commands and not committing adultery with the sultry Potiphar's wife, do you remember how Joseph explained all those 12 or 13 years of trouble before he was elevated, promoted? Genesis 50, verses 18 to 21. Then his brothers also went and fell down before his face, and they said, Behold, we're your servants. Joseph said, Don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? Verse 20, Genesis 50, verse 20. As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. In order to bring it about as to this day to save many people alive. Therefore, don't be afraid. I will provide for you and your little ones. And he comforted them, and he spoke kindly to them. Wow. So when Joseph was being sold by his own brothers, I doubt very much that at that moment, because we learned to grow in this concept I'm preaching today, I doubt very much at that moment that he was thinking, thank you, Father, thank you, God in heaven, thank you, thank you, this is going to work out for good to your purpose. Thank you. When he was thrown into jail, to a dungeon, rats nibbling at his feet at night, beaten, being beaten, God did this. God allowed it. God meant it for good. So looking back at it, all that made sense finally to Joseph, now getting close to 20 years later or so by the time this was said. When we finally understand that God uses pain, suffering, illness, trials, even death, to bring about in us what he's trying to produce for all eternity, we can get to the point of not being anxious for anything. God is refining us. I mean... When we're younger, we're concerned about someone putting a little dent in our car. <laughs> you know, I remember I was in a bad accident, not our fault, but somebody 
was trying to overtake, and I had pulled off the side of the road for something. My wife and her little daughter, Rachel, was with us, and her dog was with us. And it ended up the short story with this big pickup truck slamming into my side, boom, knocking us into the ditch. And anyway, my whole left side of my car was wiped out. When I went to the insurance to go turn it in, report it, there was a woman ahead of me practically screaming how terrible this guy was. Ruined my car. I couldn't help but go see her ruined car, and I couldn't even see where there was a dent. Couldn't, or a mark of any kind. She was so upset. He put a mark on my car. God wants us to get past all that. And she looked at me and says, what about you? I said, well, there, there's my car over there. And the whole side was gone. So this is how, even when your daughter dies or son dies, is not healed. Even when you lose your job or you don't get the job promotion you're hoping for, when you run out of money to live on, even when you're told you have cancer, even when you're not feeling well and it's getting worse, we must, in faith, not be anxious for anything. Go back now on your own and read Jesus' own words at the end of Matthew 6, starting in verse 25 all the way to the end. In Matthew 6, he says probably five or six times, Do not worry. Or King James says, Take no thought about your life, what you will eat, what you will be clothed in. Give it no thought. Do not worry, New King James says. Or as Paul puts it, be anxious for nothing. Yeah, even when they're going to put us through the fire or torture me or my family. Some horrible times are coming, brethren. God will deliver many of us. Probably the ones who will most likely be delivered will be those who will be thanking God and not being anxious even about these things. The so number one, don't be anxious about anything. Understand instead that even in the bad things, it's probably especially in the bad things, even the bad things we caused, even the sins we caused. Yeah, you heard me say that. God can turn even those sins around to be something fantastic. David and Uriah and Bathsheba, it was from that sin that was forgiven. It was from that line of David and Bathsheba where the Messiah came by, came through. I mean, isn't that amazing that even in our sins, God is able to work out his purpose. Even in the sins of Joseph's brothers, God meant it for good. So as we go through difficult times, let's grow in understanding to be less anxious about things. I've got to grow in that too. I get anxious. My, my Kenyan friends keep asking for help that I rarely have. And if any of you ever do want to help us in Kenya, about four or five of you now are doing that. And we really, really appreciate it. I've got to learn to just say, in fact, I said to my wife the other day, I guess when I have no money and I have to send money uh, to keep people alive, let me just relax. God will send it. Let me thank him for it. God will send it. And time and time again, he does. I've got to learn not to be anxious for that. Now, they might tell me that. But then I imagine they would feel some anxiety if I never sent them any help. So they criticize me for some stress or whatever. I'm trying to overcome that. Anyway, point number two, in everything by prayer, let God know your requests with thanksgiving. He's not saying don't be anxious and just ignore everything. He's saying don't just be blind to it. But don't be anxious, but this time talk to God about it. What was the backstory of Philippians 4, verse 6? It was written to the Philippians, remember. And you can read the story of what happened in Philippi in Acts 16. And I'll put the story in the notes, but I'll just summarize it here. Paul was being criticized and persecuted because 
he spoke about the living God and people were not buying the idols and all that. And so the people in town stirred the town up against them and the magistrates tore off their clothes, Acts 16, 22, commanded them to be beaten with rods. With rods. Probably had some broken ribs. And when they'd laid many stripes on them, they threw them into the prison, commanding the jailer to keep them securely. So he put them in the dungeon, in the inner prison, verse 24, Acts 16, 24. And he fastened their feet in the stocks. So they're in stocks. They're in the dungeon. They probably have broken ribs. Probably been hit in the head a few, a few times as well. Verse 25. They're probably bleeding. You may want to look up the song by Selah. S-E-L-A-H. I bless your name. It's all about the story. I bless your name. But at midnight, Saul and Paul and Silas were praying and singing. Can you imagine that? You've all been beaten up. Your back is all bloodied. And you start, now it took them till midnight to do it, but they did start it. Praying and singing to God. They weren't just crying and complaining and saying, God's gone too far this time. I don't know if I can keep this up. He'd been left for dead in one, in one of the other towns, stoned and left for dead. Now they were praying and singing hymns to God. The prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, notice it was after they were praying and singing. After they were giving thanks. Suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundation of the prisons were shaken. Immediately all the doors were open. Everyone's chains were loosed. And the jailer, thinking everybody had escaped, he knew he'd be killed if that had happened, grabbed the sword and was ready to kill himself. Paul says, no, 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 we're all still here. Verse 29, he called for a light, fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. He brought them out and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? So as they were praying and singing hymns, no doubt, they were singing also about Jesus, about Yeshua. And no doubt Paul and Silas had tried to talk to him about it because this is a strange question otherwise, unless there had been some background information there. So they said, verse 31, Acts 16, 31, Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. Now, Philippians 4, verse 6 and 7 says, In everything give thanks. Ephesians 5, 20 says something different. Ephesians 5, 20 and 21, giving thanks always for all things. I don't know how you get around those words. In everything and for all things to God the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Read that again and again until you can start believing it. Believe it as your instruction. Then add Philippians 4, 6, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. In everything. You've just been told you have diabetes. You've just been told that you might lose some your, your toes from the diabetes. You've just been told you have cancer, melanoma, or liver cancer, pancreatic cancer. Get your affairs in order. You might have just months to live. You've just been told by your wife that she wants a divorce. Not, it's not happened here, but these are horrible things. Or your kids have been cut off from you somehow. In everything, with thanksgiving. In everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving. With thanksgiving. Everything. Really? Is thanking God in everything part of this? This is what makes it such an impossible to believe scripture for many of you. Unless you've been listening the last 20 minutes or so. When we go to God, we expect him to always work things out better and beautifully than we could ever imagine. It doesn't always work that way. The truth is sometimes he does it that way, but sometimes we're not healed. As you all know, sometimes we're killed. As you all know, 
Sometimes some of us die. We're all going to end up dying if Christ doesn't come back in our lifetime. Sometimes we're hurt. Sometimes we go through divorce or ghosted by our own children. Thanking God for everything means everything all the time. Like Ephesians 5 says, always, for all things. Because it shows God we know he knows what he's doing. He knows what we're going through. And he's doing something with the suffering. One man came up to me when I gave the sermon about thanking God in all things. Even before we see the answer, he says, okay, Philip, this was ridiculous. He says, I'm supposed to thank God for my hemorrhoids. That really happened. My answer was, yes, I don't know how else you understand always in all things and in everything. He says, how can I thank God for my hemorrhoids? I, well, you can start by saying thank you that they're only hemorrhoids. Now, I've had hemorrhoids too. They're no fun. I don't have them now, but I've had them in the past. They're no fun, but there are a lot worse things you could have. You can thank him that he's there to, to present this to him. You can thank him that he can heal you if you have faith. And you could go on and on. We can thank God that we can give him the problem and cast it to Christ. We can ask to be healed. So what do we do with the bad news stuff that he allows us to go through? Where's your focus? Are you focused on the bad news? Or are you focused on Almighty God, on Father, who is King of the whole universe? That's your dad. That's your Father, Holy Father. Amazing Father. Do we focus on Him, or too often we stew about the problem? We mull it over and over and over as we're trying to go to sleep, and we can't go to sleep. We spend far more time than we do praying about it. We fret, we worry, we're anxious, we go over and over it in our minds. Like a chess match, what are the possible ramifications if I do this and he does that? Or he, just like that. Or we go over and over the doctor's newest medical report instead of talking to God. So change your focus. Focus on God, not on the problem. When Hurricane Matthew was threatening to demolish our home, According to the path of the storm, I rebuked it in Jesus' name. We had gotten up about 2 a.m. Our little, we were staying with my daughter and her little two-year-old or something, or year-old, whatever he was then, um, had come to our room and was crying. He needed to be changed. Carol got up and did that. So I checked my smartphone to see what was happening with the hurricane, and it was not good news. It showed that it would be hitting our house by early morning, with 135 mile an hour steady winds with gusts up to 150. This was Hurricane Matthew. It had been hugging the east coast of Florida for days, barely moving. Now it was coming right to where it would hit our home. Anyway, so I got up and I rebuked it in Jesus' name. I commanded it to go back out to sea, 50 miles, get out of here. The power of Jesus' name, Hurricane Matthew, get out. And then I prayed for peace in all of that. And then my wife came into the room, asked me about, about it, and I told her about my prayer. Her response was, so we don't need to worry about our house. Whatever God's going to allow is fine. It's just a house, Philip. It's according to his purpose. We can work with that. Let's not keep, keep thinking about it. This was probably about 9 or 10, 12, 11 years ago. Come on, let's get back to bed, she says. And we did. And we slept beautifully. Hurricane Matthew did jump out to sea suddenly. Had been hugging the coast all before that. Nobody in Orlando, Florida, where we live, was hurt or damaged. There was no impact. So let God know. He knows already. He wants to hear you tell him. Trust in Him. I don't always handle tests that well. Too many times I've pondered it, especially years ago. I pondered all my many options, like moves on a chessboard. No, no, no. First Peter 5, 6 and 7. 
Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. Verse 7, 1 Peter 5, 7. Casting all your care upon him. Throw it away. Throw it onto him. For he cares for you. Hebrews 13, 5 and 6. You guys know that verse. He himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Now we might feel left and forsaken when he doesn't take away the hurricane or when he doesn't take away the pain or the problem. But we have to come to this promise. He will never leave us nor forsake us. So we may boldly say the Lord is my helper. Verse 6, Hebrews 13, 6, I will not fear. And David tells us what to do in Psalm 56, verse 3 and 4. Whenever I am afraid, I will trust in you. In God, I praise this word. In God, I put my trust. I will not fear. What can the flesh do to me? When I'm afraid, so it's okay to start off in fear. But we must not remain in fear. I will trust in you. Okay, first one, first point was don't be anxious about anything. Realize God's working something out. And it does, he doesn't always work it out to the good we want, but according to his purpose. And he uses pain and suffering, including with his own son, over and over again, to develop in us the perfection he's looking for us. And the second one is, now be thanks. Now be thankful in everything, in everything. And then point number three, the result will be that you will feel this incredible peace that's beyond understanding, hard to explain, that will come upon you when you do the first things. If you're not feeling a deep peace in the suffering and trials you're going through, in the lack of money, you have no money, in the lack of healing, you're in pain, it's because you're not doing points one and two. If you do points one and two, point three has to happen. Godly peace can only come from God. It's even the third fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace. Love, joy, peace. John 14, verse 27. Jesus said, My peace I give to you. My peace. Not as the world gives. Let, don't let your heart be troubled. Let not your heart be troubled. It's something we can do. Just don't let it be troubled. Neither let it be afraid, but rather accept the peace of God. Isaiah 26, verse 3 and 4, one of my favorite verses in all the Bible. You'll keep in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you. Remember I talked about our focus. You'll keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Trust in Yehovah forever for in Yah Yehovah is everlasting strength. And we can have that perfect peace if we understand that all the things we're going through, God's going to connect all of that in our lives and in the future like Joseph, like Job, be able to look back and see how God used those things. I mean, Joseph, he really was quite proud and uh, high and mighty, you're all going to bow down before me. I saw it in my dreams and visions and things. And God had to take him down a few pegs. And suffering will do that. So he was accused of being an attempted rapist. And he had to live with that for a while. But when we understand what God's doing, we can work with it. So often, I allude in the sermon on the, that I gave the link to, so, so often God's miracles started when people started praising and praising and praying to God even before, they had, before God had done anything. Just like I read about Paul and Silas. When they started praying and singing hymns, God loosed their chains. So when you're being persecuted unjustly, Thank God for that man or woman. Ask God to bless them. Bless your enemies. Pray for those who spitefully use you. Remember? You're far more likely to see powerfully answered prayer when we do that. 
I remember asking for blessings on a, on a woman who had been persecuting me. And as I prayed for blessing, God gave me some beautiful answers. Losing some years back, I was told by my son-in-law that he could no longer run the website Light on the Rock. He just didn't have the time to do it anymore, though I was paying him some money, probably wasn't enough, and I didn't have money to pay more. So I prayed to God, and I just said, God, I've checked around. It's going to cost a lot more to hire someone to do this than I ever thought, and I don't have the money for that. And so if you want Light on the Rock to continue, you're going to have to show me that you have that in mind and provide for it. I need a webmaster. If you don't give me an answer to that, I will take your answer to mean you shut it down. You shut it down. You don't need to continue Light on the Rock. That's what I was saying to God in prayer. I thanked him for the time I did have with my son-in-law and also thank God that, uh, that he would supply an answer uh, if I should keep the website going or not. If there's no answer, I'd let it end. As I ended the prayer, was wrapping it up, my phone rang. It was Scott Doucette, who is, anyway, Scott Doucette, I'd never met him before. He just called in to say that he found the website very helpful. He had learned a lot from it. It had helped them a lot in various ways. And then out of the blue, he says, Philip, could you use any help on your website? <laughs> I thought, wow. And I said, I told him what had happened. And then he says, well, it just so happens that I manage the, the websites for several big corporations like the CDC in Atlanta, for example, and for a, um, one of the aircraft manufacturing companies, I forget which one it was, if it was, um, I mean, it's one of the big military ones, and something else, Coca-Cola or something like that. And I just couldn't believe it. I just couldn't believe it that here's a guy asking me if I could use help on my website. And I said, yeah, I could. I certainly could. So he offered then to handle my website. And I remember saying to him, I can't afford you. He says, I haven't said anything about cost. I'll do it for nothing. So as I prayed that prayer and was wrapping up, God immediately gave me an answer. That you, Philip, you don't need to worry about it. So you can, uh, you can also read Second Chronicles 20, the whole chapter. Jehoshaphat being attacked by Moab and Ammon and Edom coming together against Judah. And verse 3, 2 Chronicles 20, verse 3, Jehoshaphat feared. Then he did the right thing. He set himself to seek Jehovah, and he proclaimed a fast throughout Judah. They gathered together. They prayed. They were told by a prophet, a Levite, tomorrow, go out there and meet them. Yep, yeah, you heard me right. Go out there. Leave the walls of the city and meet them. And you will see the you will see the glory of the Lord. And they did. And as they marched out early the next morning, in verse twenty one, second Chronicles twenty, twenty one, twenty two, Jehoshaphat stops everybody, says, Wait, something's wrong here. I why do we have our finest soldiers in front? I want to call the choir out here. He appointed those who would sing to the Lord, who should praise the beauty of holiness. So they went out before the army, in front of the army, and they were singing, Praise the Lord, praise Jehovah, for his mercy endures forever. And when they began to sing and to praise, the short story is God caused these people to attack and kill each other. Their enemies, I mean, to kill each other. And when Judah came over the brow of the hill and looked down, they saw everybody dead. They never had to fight. But it was, verse 22, when they began to sing and to praise, that God did that. It would be the equivalent of saying, when they began to give thanks for all things, that God did that. 
so many stories in the Bible in my own life as well that I could tell. And it doesn't always end beautifully like Second Chronicles 20. Sometimes, sometimes it's horrible things. I mean, Daniel himself as a young man was taken as a captive to Babylon. Now, in the long term, according to God's purposes, it worked out. But as he was being hauled off to Babylon as a captive, I'm sure he didn't feel like it was something God was doing for good. But we must learn, please, we must learn to, in all things and for all things, to thank God because it shows we understand that God is working in our lives and a lot of times he's going to use or even send pain and suffering. Pain and suffering into our lives. Even if it comes from Satan like it did Job, in the end it says God had sent those to Job. Job 42, 11 or so. So no matter what's happening, good or bad, even if it's your fault that there's a divorce, even if it's your fault that you're being penalized now because of something stupid you did. You can take that to God, repent to God, ask Him to work it out for good to His purpose, and He will. And it may take a long time for you to see His purpose being worked out. But I hope you will be moved to practice this very difficult passage in Philippians 4, verse 6 and 7. To not worry or be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer, give thanks in all things and for all things. And then experience the peace of God that comes out. Okay, now that I've been doing that, it's in God's hands. Just like Carol said to me, okay, you prayed about the hurricane. If God demolishes or lets our home be demolished, so be it, Philip. But if God decides to protect our home and everybody else's, so be it. You've done your part. Let's go to bed and sleep. And we did. So I hope if you practice this, you'll, you'll start experiencing things in your life that will start to happen that will drastically change your life. Father, we thank you so much that we can come to you no matter what's happening to us, in our perception of whether they're good things or bad things, that in everything we can thank you for it. For all things, even the sins we commit, like David and Bathsheba, Uriah and all that, you worked that out, you forgave them, there were consequences, yes, but through that very line you produced the Messiah's line through that. And many other examples we can use of how you develop people and, and use their weaknesses and use their problems to develop them to become the leaders you want them to be to be ready for positions you have ready for them in the kingdom so father help us to please apply this verse as painfully hard as it is that when painful painful things happen to us that we can praise you and thank you even for the surgery going badly even for the divorce going through after all even for the house burning down. Sounds crazy. But when we know you're in our life, it's not crazy. We know you're testing us and refining us and purifying us. We must learn how to do this. We thank you and we praise you in our mighty Savior's name, Jesus Christ. Our mighty Savior, thank you so much. Amen and amen.